What's up, everybody? Stacking Surfer here. Welcome to the show tonight. Um, I have got a special guest for us today. This is Andy Schickman from Miles Franklin. He is the CEO and um, founder of Miles Franklin, and I'm excited to have him here. I had a great opportunity uh, a few weeks back, maybe it's even been a month now, to meet Andy in person at the Silver Symposium in uh, Las Vegas, which was a great opportunity. And many of you have already seen the video um, of, of Andy giving his presentation. And if you haven't, um, I've got a link right here that you guys can go take a look at. Uh, but I definitely recommend you go look at that. This is a follow-up to that video. And then um, also I'm hoping to have Andy on soon to do a live Q&A with you guys. So, so Andy, kind of going off of that, um, what I wanted to do is, is pick your brain a little bit on how things have changed in the last 30 days or so. And has that changed any of your opinion of where we're headed and where we're going? Well, I think the world is, first of all, thanks for having me. And it was good to meet you in Vegas. And I remember the stories you were telling me about your family and, and, and your background. And uh, it, it resonates a lot with me the more I think about it now where we are in this cycle. And, but anyways, it's an honor to be here and thank you and for the kind words. Um, yeah, I think, I think to your point, the world is changing much more quickly than most Americans understand. And because there's virtually no coverage of the rest of the world other than where we're supposed to be focusing in the American media, Americans don't have a good sense of what's, of what's coming. So to, to your point, to your question, if anything, what we're seeing right now only in my mind accelerates my vision of ultimate de-dollarization and ultimately the dollar losing its, its petrol reserve status. And I think you could argue that what we are seeing right now in many cases, I think if you take a step back, will, um, will be that moment that accelerates the understanding for, from these OPEC nations that are all coalescing that their interests ideologically, economically, uh, are not aligned morally even, are not aligned with the US. And, and maybe this actually pushes the agenda a little faster, a little further than I had even anticipated. And do you, do you see it being something that is gonna be, I mean, obviously you just mentioned it's accelerating. Um, do you see it something that still takes a fair amount of time, like, years to a decade? Or do you see this being something that could just happen overnight and it changes? Yeah, I, I am a big fan of the term logarithmic decay. Yep. Uh, you can visualize that by being on a raft on the Niagara River and you slowly notice the pitch start to changing little by little by little by little by little by little by little, by little bang all at once. And if you pay attention to the things that are happening around the world, um, in particular with this coalition of countries uh, that are finding safety in numbers that, that already represent north of 80% of human population when you throw in the Belt Road Initiative with the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union, you're talking eight out of 10 people in the world. Um, and these are our uh, countries that are not going green, and, and we are. And so as it pertains to what's happening in the Middle East, uh, as it pertains to um, OPEC and, and oil, yeah, I, I think it's just beginning. I think it's, um, it will be worse as a result of what is happening right now. It will speed things up um, because this is something that I thought would, wouldn't be decades. Um, would happen certainly sooner than most of the dollar bulls would tell you it would. A lot of the people who um, speak to the fact that the dollar will always be the reserve currency, that there's nothing as strong and stable as the reserve currency. Who would trust the BRICS nations? I've pushed back and say, who the heck would trust the West any longer? Um, and I think the acceleration will come as a result of um, you know, these countries deciding, look, we just don't align with them any longer. Look, look at it from the standpoint of Saudi Arabia, who broke the peace deal with Israel, who has in the span of, you know, one year, along with Iran, joined the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, joined the New Development Bank, uh, told all of the uh, countries in Davos at the World Bank, meaning that, hey, we're, we're open to taking uh, new currencies for oil. Um, 
and have struck deals with all of these countries that they're doing business with now to settle energy over the next year in, in um, local currencies. And you're seeing huge examples of that all around the world. Even our allies like France bought a massive liquid natural gas deal from the United Arab Emirates and paid in, in Yuan. We see the first ever cross-border payment in, for energy in digital Yuan. It just happened last week and it was announced by the exchange in China. They didn't tell us who the counterparty was, but we're seeing countries trade, you know, for rupee or for ruble or for yuan. We see Brazil, the second largest exporter of corn in the world, struck a deal with Brazil to sell their coin and their soybeans and anything else they do to China um, in, and pay for it in yuan and accept trade from them uh, in, in, um, uh, in real. I mean, this is a situation where all of these currencies, all of these countries are little by little by little striking deals. There was a lot of people who were upset that they didn't issue a gold-backed settlement currency at the August meeting, the way guys like James Rickards said they would. Well, they will. It's just that they are far more methodical than we are, and they are doing it the right way. They are building a large enough base where acceptance becomes a real game changer, where first there were five countries in the BRICS. They just admitted, uh, or six, and they just admitted Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, the United Arab Emirates. Um, there were six. Now there's there's or there are six new ones. There were five. Now there's eleven. And you know you're talking about uh, little by little. There's 27 countries that have expressed interest in joining the BRICS. 22 informally have, including Mexico. And so I think they have been waiting to have enough of a coalition, enough of an infrastructure, enough in the way of um, energy production. Look, look at the countries that, that they signed on, right? Saudi Arabia, Iran, United, Emir United Arab Emirates. So those are all major oil producers. You have Argentina, which is obviously a big agricultural producer, but they're also the largest produce producer of natural gas in South America. You have Egypt, and I think they were added simply because they control the Suez Canal. Um, and then you have, uh, and don't forget, Argentina controls the Straits of Magellan. Um, and, and then you have Ethiopia, which is the fastest growing economy in Africa. They're, they're laying the foundation to when they do make that switch, that they do it in a way that is lasting. They, the, the finance ministers of these countries were tasked with going back to the drawing board, finding a solution, a lasting solution for a common settlement currency coming back to the meeting in Russia next year and providing their, um, their findings. But at the same time, we are seeing uh, talk of inclusion with the BRICS being the Eurasian Economic Union and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the largest financial and the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet, which Iran has just joined and Saudi Arabia has applied to. You put all of these countries together along with the Belt Road Initiative, which is China's endeavor trying to connect Asia, Africa, uh, South America and parts of Europe, uh, which already represents 75% of human population and 50% of global GDP as is, you put all these countries together, you're talking between eight and nine people out of every 10 on the globe. 80 to 90% of the world's population is in this coalescing entity. And the West doing what they're doing in a... In, in a, um, in a in a fashion that employs coercion rather than cooperation in a fashion whereby you can weaponize the dollar and expect no consequences uh, in, a, in, in a country that has told Saudi Arabia, which is the linchpin to the dollar hegemony, look, we protect you for 50 years since 74. We got your back, but you'll value oil globally in dollars, you and OPEC. And then you'll take the proceeds of, of those dollars that you get for the sale and you'll put them into treasuries. Well, look at how that's worked out for them in, over the last few years as the 10-year treasury is down 50% and the dollar is being inflated to worthlessness and an ideological viewpoint that diverges dramatically from the West. How much more do they really need to take before they say, hey, listen, thanks for the memories, guys, but we're going to issue oil and other currencies. And at that moment right there, it becomes a religious experience for the people in this country who have no idea what's coming because every country on the planet has had to stockpile dollars for the last 
50 years in order to buy oil. That is a synthetic demand that like that ends. And the dumping of dollars collectively across the globe creates a tsunami of inflation that hits our shores. Here's your Klaus Schwab moment where stocks, bonds, and real estate are inversely correlated to a massive spike in interest rates. Well, you know, the Fed has been raising interest rates fast, but not even above the real level of inflation, which the CPI doesn't really tell us because it excludes food, energy, yep. and housing. But what if everyone dumps dollars and we have 25% inflation because there's 10 times more currency outside the US than is, and it hits our shores and the dollar collapses and inflation and how rises. How fast did that happen, Andy? How fast it did would that happen in, in the blink of an eye. And I think in a blink of an eye. morning. In something yeah, like I this. mean, you would see markets open limit down, you would see markets shut. But if everyone dumps dollars at the exact same time, because OPEC says we're not taking them anymore, and all of these countries have stockpiled them, have no need to own them, they dump them. Those dollars hit our shore, creating huge inflation, and the byproduct of that is spiked interest rates to compensate. You cannot have 5% interest rate on the 10-year treasury with you know 30% inflation. You're, you're, you might as well use it as toilet paper, your bills. So at that moment, the market, which is far more powerful than any central bank, would say, no, 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 uh, interest rates are now 30%. Well, what happens to stocks, bonds, and real estate at 30%? What's a 40% 30-year mortgage if there are even any being sold? It's where everything is leveled at the exact same time. And I have come to this conclusion for, for many factors, which we can talk about, but uh, I think what's happening in the Middle East will only accelerate this ultimate outcome, which I, in my presentation, you'll remember, I believe is being orchestrated. And, and th those were the things that I tried to connect the dots to show people. I agree. And when you talk orchestration, there's two points I want to kind of throw out to you to get, get, get some thoughts on. So um, one in my day job, um, I work for a software company and I'm seeing more and more software companies get involved in this idea of ESG and being able to figure out how to come up with an individualized carbon credit score and how do we help companies be able to monitor that and regulate it. The second, the second thought is um, coming from a banking family, I've shared that with a few of my friends and, and a few of the people on my channel, but um, savings and loans were taken away from being able to make profitability through owning shopping centers and higher margin um, uh, instruments. And we're really forced to get into more subprime lending. And to me, it looked very systematic in approach of, of creating a perfect storm, but waiting for the storm to happen. And once the storm happened, then, you know, you don't let any good um, crisis go to waste, so to speak, is, is the quote. I forget exactly who that's from. Um, but my thought there is I'm seeing a lot of the same stuff happening with regional banks right now. So I look at two things. We're shooting ourselves in the foot with the ESG regulation, which is not profitable for companies. And we're also now starting to put banks into situations with the higher interest rates that could cripple them because of the, um, the way that lending's done today. So I was wondering kind of your thoughts on that and, and where you sit and what you think can lead to um, where that's going to lead us. How is that going to affect everything else you've just mentioned? Well, if, you, if, you, um, if you're a corporation and making your decisions upon, you know, um, gender and, and race and um, uh, these types of social environments uh, and, and topics, which I guess people like to call woke, um, you're in trouble. I mean, when you run a business, it sh you should be hiring people based upon um, their ability. Are they are they punctual? Or do they work hard? Are they honest? Uh, I don't care who they sleep with or what they do when they're outside my office. Are they qualified? Uh, are, are they good at what they do uh, and, and, you know, merit-based rather than gender-based or, or, or um, ethnicity or any of those things that we are being told we have to abide by? Look at uh, uh, BlackRock. I mean, you know, Larry Fink evidently called every one of the executives or the, the CEOs of the companies he invests in and says, you guys better be ESG or we can't invest with you. Well, when you're controlling such a large portion of, of, of the percentage of these companies float, that's that holds a lot of weight. Uh, and that's why you got companies like, uh, you know, some of these like Chevron or X, I think it was Chevron. I read recently they want to get out of the oil business. I mean, it's it's the, the this 
this whole thing of, of having to hire people on equality rather on merits is just flat out stupid. And that's not what this country stood for and will only make us a whole hell of a lot worse and, and weakened. Uh, where it's not about the color or your religion or your beliefs, but how hard you've worked and how qualified you are to do a good job. I mean, that's what it should be, uh, in my opinion. In terms of the banks, you know, I talk a lot about two people leading the economic um, um, advisory at the United States government. The first is Jared Bernstein and his whole uh, thesis is to lose the world's reserve status by the U.S. dollar. He's openly written reports about it called Dethrone King Dollar. When when uh, uh, Trump slapped tariffs on China, he said, good, hopefully the U.S. loses its reserve status. That was picked up in the Washington Post. This is a man with a degree in music and a master's degree in social work, and he is the number one lead economic advisor to the United States government, to the Biden administration. And if you look at if trying to lose the reserve status, the first two things that I would do would be to weaponize the dollar, make everyone think, oh, they're coming for me next, to push everyone away into a coalition that we call the BRICS now, or, and I would tell Saudi Arabia, the linchpin of the hegemony for which everyone has to accumulate dollars, hey, thanks for memories, fellas, we're going green. And we've signed an executive order to attest to that, where by 2050, we aim to be 80% green, 50% by 2030. What the hell do they need us for? That's stage one. Stage two is the banks. Lael Brainerd, modern monetary theorist, number two economic advisor to the U.S. government, uh, spent time at the Treasury, then transitioned to the Federal Reserve, actually ran against Powell when he was up for reappointment, was uh, nominated rather as vice chair instead. Uh, she worked with MIT while she was at the Fed in development of the central bank digital currency that was also written into law by executive order. The Bank of International Settlements, which is very influential in my life, it's the most influential bank on the planet, the central bank or central bank, not only in 2019 reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one reserve asset after it only being dollars for nearly 70 plus years. Well, gold is too, they say, quietly. You have to dig for it. Google it, it'll pop up, but you don't see the mainstream talking about it. But the other thing they said was that by 2025, every country on the planet must have an operational CBDC. And right now, if you take the gross domestic product of the world, those countries that make up 95% of it have a CBDC either operational or, or ready to be operational or in development. It's coming. So if you look at what Lil Brainerd is all about, she helped develop the CBDC with MIT, and she also ran point while at the Fed for FedNow, which just came out two months ago. And for those who don't know what FedNow is, it's Venmo or Zelle issued by the Federal Reserve. It will take the place of checks and of wires within a year. It's instant settlement with the Federal Reserve backing it. You don't have to wait three hours to get a wire or if you're getting it from Switzerland two days or you don't have to wait while we send a check through the mail or for it to clear or someone stealing a check blank and identity theft and all of these things. Well, Fed now takes care of it. It is the appetizer before the central bank digital currency. The convenience of it, which has already been proven by everyone who's younger than you and I with Zelle and Venmo. I mean, I use Venmo. I use Zelle. It's convenient. Uh, you, you know, you're playing golf with your buddies. You lose 20 bucks. Is that Venmo them? I got a friend who's got a Venmo tag on his golf bag. Take a picture of this when you lose to me, basically, is what he's saying. And, you know, so that's going to be met with um, acceptance. And then all of a sudden, here's the new CBDC, which is coming. Um, I think... The problem, however, is that most people don't want to take the CBDC. So what would Lil Brainerd have to say to that? Lil Brainerd is a modern monetary theorist. Her whole idea is to call the banks, to blow them up, and to have all of this central bank-issued money run through the Federal Reserve and only a handful of three, four, five banks doing all of the work, uh, mortgages and, and loans and all of those kinds of things. And how do you get there? Well, take a look at what we see happening. When Silicon Valley Bank failed, and by the way, complete and total crap that it was bailed out, right? During the Dodd-Frank Act, after the great financial crisis, bailouts were made illegal, illegal. And this is why there was such outrage when Silicon Valley Bank was bailed out. You wanna talk conspiracy, um, 
there they had when there was an inquiry into the Silicon Valley Bank failure, the, the one of the senators in the House said, um, or, or one of the, the representatives in the House said, hey, um, let me ask you a question. Why the hell for three years in 2020, 2021 and 2022 with interest rates near zero? Did you have 10 checking accounts at your bank for three years that had a cumulative balance of $14 billion? On average, $1.4 billion per account, earning zero in interest. And with $250,000 FDIC limit, where was risk management at the banks? Where the hell was risk management at the corporations who held these accounts? And where the hell was the FDIC then? and somehow they were bailed out. Now, maybe this got the ball rolling down the hill. We added 14,000 clients in 45 days when that happened. That's four to five years worth of client acquisition in 45 days, and it was bailed out. But people don't know that's illegal. And when the senator from Oklahoma questioned Janet Yellen in the House inquiry, the, 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 the representative, um, she said, um, oh, uh, yeah, no, uh, th th we bailed them out because it was an uber majority decision between myself, uh, the FOMC, which is the um, Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the president. And it was an uber majority decision that they had to be bailed out because it was too systemic. And so he says, this guy from Oklahoma, you can Google it, say Google Oklahoma uh, Representative grills Janet Yellen in inquiry, and he's she she says to her, "Well, does that mean if a bank fails in Oklahoma, a regional bank, you're going to make my constituents whole?" And she said, "No, no, no, we won't, because um, it will have to once again require uber majority vote from the FOMC, the FDIC, myself, and the president." Well, that lit a fuse under the banks, and if you look at what happened, all the money that left the regional banks, which we are being told will be bailed in, not bailed out. Yep. You are an unsecured general creditor to the bank. Anything over $250,000 is bailed in to the bank to make it whole. And what you get back, if any money is left over, is in a pro rata fashion. Most likely you will get shares of a bank that is defaulted and hopefully JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs buys them and you get some of your money back. But you're an unsecured general creditor. That was written into law. So yeah, what has happened is that I don't yes. think very many people have any clue about that. I think right, they don't. I've gone out to lunch and dinner with some very prominent business people over the last month, and I ask every one of them, and none of them know what it is. Yeah, and it will it will blow up the banking sector, and I'll show you how. Because so so you you have this situation where we're being told that the regional banks who all have fractured balance sheets because. They were all told that, you know, all believed that interest rates would stay zero range bound forever. And all of the deposits that people made into those banks, they were offsetting them with treasuries. So when you deposit money into a regional bank, it's an asset to you. It's a liability to the bank. The bank offsets that liability with an asset. That asset traditionally had been 10-year treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. But, you know, those treasuries are all yielding 1% and 2%. And then all of a sudden, even though they didn't raise rates high enough in, in relation to inflation, they raised them faster than ever before. So those banks are all sitting on massive losses, on unrealized losses on their treasury book. Now, if they could hold them to maturity for 10 years, fine. They got another five, six years to hold them. Fine, they'll get their money back uh, plus the 2%. But what if everyone rushes to the door like they did in Silicon Valley Bank at the same time, so give me my money? Because remember during COVID, the, the president said, well, the banks really don't need to hold much of anything in the way of reserves. So the banks take all of that money that's deposited. If they don't lend it out, then they'll get, they'll buy treasuries with it. A lot of those loans, um, and by the way, they're responsible, the regional banks, for 70% of the commercial real estate and the 70% of all the small business loans. So as those loans go bad, that's bad for the banks. And as people run and say, give me back my money, think of all the banks that were just downgraded. Um, give me back my money. These banks are forced to go into their treasury holdings. Their unrealized losses become realized losses. And in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, it put them out of business in 36 hours. That's coming. But why do I say that? When this happened, most of the money went from that left the regional banks that were going to fail or potentially will fail and be bailed in into the banks that Janet told us are too big to fail, like JP Morgan. We've seen a trillion dollars go into 
money markets. By the way, most people know, even know less. Some people may know what bail-ins are. Most people don't know that at the same time they implemented bail-in legislation within the Dodd-Frank Act, they also implemented money market gating legislation. Because when um, Lehman Brothers failed, they held a lot of the money market funds and everyone tried to yank their money out simultaneously. And it, it turned the money markets upside down. It's called breaking the buck. And when that happened, they said, we can't ever let this happen again. So they, you know, get back your principal. So they implemented gating. So if it happens again, sorry, you're locked in, you can't leave. So anyways, when this happened, what was allowing all of the money to go to the too big to fail banks is the fact, I believe, that the money markets that these banks, the big banks and institutions offer have been allowed to invest directly in the overnight reverse repo market of the Federal Reserve, which is guaranteed by the Fed and paying 5.3%. So ask yourself, would you rather sit in a regional bank with a horrible balance sheet that is not too big to fail and the best return you're going to get, I mean, you're getting a half a percent in your savings account still, yep. and the best return you're going to get in a one-year money market is four and a half percent. You got to leave it there for a year in a bank that's systemically dangerous, or you go to a too big to fail bank, which we all thought we should avoid to begin with and go to the regional bank. So I guess we were wrong. Um, that has a massively horrible balance sheet, but the government will backstop supposedly, and you can get daily liquidity in a money market account at five and a third percent. So you get more money with daily liquidity in a bank that's too big to fail or less money waiting for a year to receive it in a bank that could fail and be bailed in. Well, that's no brainer. So all of that money has left the regional banks and gone into the commercial banks, into their money market accounts into the overnight reverse repo market. But here's where it gets interesting. The treasury says, well, we're gonna sell, you know, six month treasuries at five and a half percent, or even, you know, 90 day treasuries at five and a half percent, which is higher than what the, the Fed is, or the Fed is paying in the reverse repo market. So how about all of that money getting siphoned out of the reverse repo market? Uh, and out of the big commercial bank accounts, more money is left to commercial banks than the regional banks, get that. And it's going directly to treasurydirect.gov. You go to treasurydirect.gov and buy treasuries right from the US government and you get rid of all of the bank risk. Well, that's what the big money is doing. That's what all the money within the reverse repo market is doing, which has another effect. The reverse repo market and the, and the repo market without getting too deep into it is where companies who have excess money park it for a little bit of return backed by the Fed, and those who need a little liquidity will borrow overnight, pledge securities like treasuries, borrow overnight, get their treasuries back the next day. It's a, it's a liquidity pool, basically. That's all drying up and disappearing like we saw in 2019 when overnight lending rates went over 10%. So you have a situation where the banks are being bled dry. Their balance sheets are horrible. The money supply is decreasing. Things are slowing down. So put it all together. What does Lael Brainerd want? She wants the banks to collapse. How do the banks collapse? Well, I'll tell you exactly how. Forget about Saudi Arabia dumping dollars and, and OPEC dumping dollars and everyone throwing their dollars at us at once, spiking interest rates, collapsing the whole system. And I think that's coming. But before that, what if the next bank that fails, let's say it was a PNC or a Truist or or any of these big regional banks with ridiculously over leveraged and undercapitalized balance sheets, fails and it's bailed in as the law says it must be what do you think is going to happen to the collective psyche of this of this country when we got forty five thousand clients or fourteen thousand clients in 45 days when the bank was bailed in and no one knows what bail or bailed out and no one knows what bail in is I, and it takes one. i think it takes one company and that's one. it that's it and then they all run yep. and and the act of collectively running on the banks means they all need to sell their treasuries to, to meet those redemptions. The treasury yield spikes to the moon as a result, 10 years fall even further, and it's a doom loop. And everyone, oh my God, did you see he owns, he owns those seven gas stations? He just lost everything. All of his operating capital, $9 million at Truist Bank, it's gone. He's, he's, he's done. He's, what happens then when everyone says, holy shit, they lost everything. Oh, did you know it was law? Do you know what the Dodd-Frank Act is? 
No, nobody does. And oh, get my money out of the money market. Sorry, you're stuck. You're gated. Ride it on down. And so if you talk about an event that could cull the banks and push everyone as fast as they can into the commercial too big to fail banks, that's exactly what Lael Brainerd wants. She wants to issue a central bank digital currency directly from the Fed. And it's much easier to do it with four or five big commercial banks than it is 4,500 regional banks. And she's publicly said this kind of stuff. So what do I think? I think we are on that way and it's being orchestrated. I truly do. Either that or our politicians are so, so stupid to not see the consequences of their actions by allowing, they, they, should, they even came out, by the way, the Fed came out in, in April and said, like, we probably need to take a look at allowing the money markets to invest in the overnight reverse repo market and sucking all the money out of these banks. Have they done anything about it? Nope, they haven't. They're still allowed to do this. And so it is just a matter of time before we see the next bank fail. And Moody's and S&P downgraded those banks to clear their conscience. And you wait, the next one, like you said, one fails. And everyone in this country, I had lunch with two guys in my country club here the other day after we played golf. Last Saturday, one owns a fruit importing company. He's very wealthy. And the other guy owns one of the largest insurance company networks in Florida. And neither of them knew what bail-in is. And I asked him, how big are your operating accounts? And I almost choked. I said, do you understand how dangerous this truly is? And uh, well, they've both been at my house here several times to discuss further because they had no idea. But no does, nor does the public. This is not make-believe. This is law. And when that happens, I think what your family experienced, um, tragically, is what the entire or a good portion of the banking world will experience. And the people who don't see what's coming can't get out of the way of it because they don't know about it. They don't. No. When Silicon Valley Bank was bailed out, they figured, oh, that's just what will happen when the next bank fails. I think it's true. And the other thing that isn't always discussed, too, um, and I'd love to get a little bit of your opinion on this, too, is what happens to the equity markets? When people, when the liquidity at the banks falls and you have regional banks starting to go down, which could happen overnight, what happens to the equity markets? Where are people needing to pull their money to be able to support their businesses and support themselves? Yeah, that's just it. The liquidity is disappearing. It's drying up. That's a good question. It's, it's a credit crisis. And, you know, for whatever reason, um, for whatever reason, I think this country believes that the only way, I mean, when you talk about the difference between Austrian economics and, and um, Keynesian economics, Keynesian economics is about debt uh, and, and um, um, debt accumulation and taxing and all of this stuff. You, you go into debt to build your infrastructure, you sell it to someone else and the, the cycle repeats. It's all about debt. You know, even your credit rate, your credit rate only goes up if you go into debt and pay it off. How about having no debt and assets and a good income? It doesn't matter. Your rates are your, your credit score goes down. They want us to go into debt. That's what we're we're supposed to do. We're supposed to feel like we're going into debt. And Austrian economics says, no, 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 no. The way you build a strong economy is through savings, investment and reinvestment. And it's backwards. And so you're right. Where does so what's happened is we've built a society and, and an economy based on debt and based on uh, the servicing of debt. And when you see things slow down the way that they are, the servicing of debt becomes very, very, very difficult. Next comes default. And when you realize that this country, in terms of its national debt, 33 trillion, 130 trillion in unfunded liabilities on top of that, a $5 trillion asset base of which the largest asset of the US government, 40% is student debt, uh, $1.6 trillion. It's a joke. We are at 130% debt to GDP and there is never in ever in 150 years a country that's crossed that line that hasn't defaulted outright, whether it be by outright default or hyperinflation. And we're right there right now. And so when you talk about um, this happening, I think it becomes more and more and more plausible by the day. I mean, just look at the fact you have a trillion and a half dollars of commercial real estate loans mm -hmm. that need to be reset in the next 10 to 12 months. Well, how the hell do you do that when the cost of money has gone up 90% in the last year and a half? How do you do that? Be As your business is slowing same. down, it's right? Just, and the cost of inputs are going up. So yeah, it's a big deal, man. It truly is a, a very, very big deal. It's going to be huge. Okay. So We've laid out we've laid out kind of the history a little bit from your your video that I that I showed from the Silver Symposium. 
we've we've built on that a little bit today too from you know what's the real systemic risk we have today so we've got a risk around de-dollarization we've got a risk around regional banks failing we've got a cbdc on the horizon um, and we also have you know liquidity and credit issues for businesses as well as um, individuals um, what are some of the recommendations you would make and how would your company be able to help people that are looking to to shore this up and get themselves on a on a more firm foundation going forward. I'd also like to just bring up one other point. You know, Perfect. we've talked about credit. We yep. are insolvent, 130% debt to GDP, 155 trillion in debt, 5 trillion in assets. So we, we're broke, we're insolvent. We've talked about the petrodollar, that we're going green. We've weaponized the dollar. The world is looking to move away from that weaponization, that coercion, uh, the hypocrisy. You know that we invaded Iraq 20 years ago um, and they're still not allowed to do anything with their oil revenue. It has to go to the New York Federal Reserve that we supposedly help uh, bring in a new government who is who is is their puppets to the West. Uh, they just asked the Fed or the government U.S. just last week, can we please have a billion of our 90 billion that we made last year in oil revenue? They said no. So they're like kiss my ass then. And they just made trading in, in dollars illegal if you own a business in, in Iraq. You'll go to prison. They'll take your business. As of January 1st, 2024, there will be no physical currency, U.S. currency, in any of the banks in Iraq. They just told the BRICS nations they're willing to join BRICS if invited. This is the coercion. This is the hypocrisy. We went in there to find weapons of mass destruction, destroyed their country and said, sorry, we didn't find any. We've occupied them for 20 years. We, we pillaged the money they get for selling their oil. Don't give it to them when they ask for it. What if that was the other way around? This is the hypocrisy that the world sees. Whether or not the West views it that way, they do. And so I just want you to, to think about that. And so the petrodollar is dead. And they're already selling in, in local currencies, not for dollars like they promised. Petrodollar's dead. The credit is dead. How about the faith? That's the last piece. This country is not united anymore. And when we ever had our backs to the wall going all the way back to the beginning, we were a united country after the Civil War. From that point forward, we were a united country, a country that believed in God, believed in, in, in respecting authority, um, believed in... in uh, you know, the nuclear family. And, and these were the things that where you could have a discussion with your brother-in-law at, at Thanksgiving about, you know, you're one side, he's the other, but it didn't end up hating each other. And that doesn't work that way anymore. Everyone's at each other's throat is divided between red and blue and black and white and vaccine, no vaccine, rich and poor. Everyone hates each other and we're not united. So when you talk about Lady Liberty holding, uh, blindfolded, holding the scales of justice, I don't care what you think of both President, former President Trump or Biden, can you really say that the, the scales of justice have been weighed equally? So when you'd look at what makes us who we are, people say, who's going to trust, trust China and Russia and the BRICS? Well, who the hell is going to trust us? We're broke. We're insolvent. We have a, a, a dual uh, standard of justice. We, we're ununited. We're at each other's throats. We're going green. Everything that you could possibly want to do to lose the world reserve status and to create this chaos is happening. Now, is it intended or is it just a coincidence? Why would they do it? Because we're broke, we're insolvent. And if we, there are two ways out, either inflation or default. How about a third way? Find a villain. Those bastards did it to us. Putin, Xi Jinping, and OPEC. They did it to us. Everything blows up. Have no fear. Lil Brainerd is here. Take your central bank digital currency, which she developed with MIT. Here it is. Sign on the dotted line. And the banks that were all hanging on, that all collapsed, all of your money in there, you now get it back as do you get back your IRA value because we're gonna we're modern monetary theorists. Take the CBDC, you're good to go. And that's the event that I think will happen to usher in the CBDC where the, the Bank of International Settlement says we need it by 2025. So what do you do? You do what the biggest money in the world is doing. I sell gold and silver. I've been accumulating it myself every two weeks for 34 years. That was a promise I made my father when I started this company. To me, it's wealth. It is not an investment. It is wealth that has outlived two world wars, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, every pandemic, and every bad thing that the world has ever tried to stick to it. And I think that's why you buy it. You buy it to get out of the system, to get out of the way 
of what is coming, whether it be money in a banking system that is hanging on by a thread or just being in dollars or any traditional assets that are all inversely correlated to a massive seismic shock in interest rates that I think is coming. So anyways, what do you do? I think you get out of debt first and foremost, best you can let the laws of compounding work for you instead of against you. And if you're not able to do that all at once, then you pay yourself first, no matter what. I don't care if it's an ounce of silver every paycheck. That was a promise I made to my father. He said, you'll buy something every two weeks or I'll fire you. That was 34 years ago. I've owned the company for two decades outright, but I've honored my promise to him. Every two weeks for 34 years, I bought something not to invest, but it is my wealth. And I let the laws of compounding work for me instead of against me. But I promise you this, if you are not a contrarian, there is a high probability you will be a victim. If you don't pay yourself first, you'll get old real fast and say, shit, I missed all that time. And you know what? If you don't do that, you never get out of the rat race. You have to value the future and paying yourself first, first. And that's what I would do because I don't think we are at the point of hoping this goes away. I think you have to realize there's a high probability that there is going to be some difficult times ahead, especially if we lose the petrodollar. And um, when that happens, you know, traditional assets are in trouble. So I don't think there's any coincidence that over the last year and a half, the most well-funded and more importantly, well-informed traders on the globe, the central banks, have bought more gold than at any time in history. And over the last nine months, those numbers are up 14% over last year, which was the biggest accumulation in history. They bought 800 tons already over the, over the first nine months. So don't do what the media or the talking heads are saying, do what they're doing. And you have to dig to see it, but the biggest, most well-funded, well-informed, influential traders on the globe are quietly using the suppression of the Western paper markets to support an illusion of dollar supremacy and the illusion of bond stability to, to de-dollarize and accumulate gold and silver. And it will be, remember, what did the Bank of International Settlements say in 2019? Oh yeah, it's the only other tier one reserve asset in the world, riskless. So the central banks are saying, let's get rid of dollars and get the only other tier one because we've destroyed the credibility of fiat currency. And if we're gonna do this and use blockchain, well, better, there's no better way to do it than anchor it to gold and show the whole world. We don't need to make it redeemable. Maybe we only have 10% of every new currency unit anchored to gold, held on a distributed ledger, have it audited. Everyone can see it, the veracity and the mutability of it. And you now have immediately installed trust and confidence in a system that has none. So what do you do? You buy gold and silver not to get wealthy, you buy it because it is wealth. You own enough of it, maybe you're wealthy, but more importantly, you have um, taken yourself out of harm's way and you own something that has been considered wealth for 5,000 years. To me, that's what I would advise my very best friend or my son or my daughter or anyone that I cared about or a client. And I mean it to my soul and I hope I'm wrong, but I'll tell you one last thing and I'll shut up. I've, I've done 1,300 videos in, in almost four years on this topic, and they're all out there. Um, it's been pretty much my singular focus for four years, and I've been right. And that's what scares me more than anything, because I've done this for 33 years, and I've never been right like this on something that I saw so clearly. And I'll admit, if you get the new copy of The Little Boy Who Cries Wolf, it's me on the cover waving. But if you read the last page, the wolf comes. And I think the wolf is coming. And I'm on record over 1,300 times saying it. So today's no different. And what's happening in the Middle East, in my mind, only accelerates um, the final outcome. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I'm doing the same thing with my friends and family, trying to wake them up as much as I can. Um, you know, I've got a lot of friends that are really into crypto. And I've been able to get them to at least peel some of their investments off into silver and gold. Um, I don't you know, part of it is, you know, crypto may do really well for a period of time. I don't know how it's going to hold up through this. We, we just don't know. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a bit more unknown. We have thousands of years of history with gold and silver. And so, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I'm not a crypto basher. I don't own very much, but I think that they're both cut from the same ideology. The only difference to me is that people who buy crypto want to get rich. People who buy gold don't want to lose what they've accumulated. The so key. if you want to you want to bring the two together, if you're in crypto and you make profits, siphon it off and put it in gold. 
and leave your original principal there. Let it ride up again, put your profit in gold and silver. Same thing. That's how you build wealth while keeping your growth position intact. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. Much like the United States not being united, I would like to see the crypto community and the metals community be united. We're fighting the same battle. We're doing things for the same reason in terms of the fundamentals of the fiat system and 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 the stupidity of our of our of our leaders and of the, the Federal Reserve monetary policy. But you know, again, I think the only divergence is one is about wealth creation and the other about wealth preservation. But there's room for the two of them. In, on the same couch and they can speak to each other cordially and say, hey, we can do this together and even be stronger. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, a lot of people in the precious metals sector, or I, I shouldn't even say sector, investors, right? People that are, okay, let me back up. A lot of people that are buying gold and silver today are either very afraid, don't understand crypto or uh, feel that it's flat out evil. Um, what they're not realizing, and then a lot of people that are investing in crypto see gold and silver as a rock that's really old and not going to do anything. Um, one of my goals in putting this channel together is to try to bring two of those groups of people together, as well as helping people get prepared for what's coming. Um, so I also like recommending having some food storage around your house. Definitely. So you don't have to run to the store if there's an SHTF situation happens. I live in Southern California. We're expecting a massive earthquake any day. And if it happens, I don't want to have to run to the store or if we have civil unrest. Yeah. Um, you know, we could have all kinds of crazy stuff that happens here that um, they can affect you. So I also keep kits in my car um, to take care of me for three days if, in case I happen to be in Los Angeles away from my house and I have a problem. Um, in addition to that, I do want to get the two groups working together a little bit more and helping them understand that. Because what I pointed out to my friend is exactly what you said. Why are you investing in crypto? It's to make money. You're not investing in crypto to save. And he agreed. And I said, when you're investing in gold, you're investing to have wealth preservation and to lock in your purchasing power. And when you invest in silver, to me, it's a, it's a great way to do future bartering if that comes. Um, it's also a great way to have fun collectibles, which can be fun to put on your desk and just, you know, to have. And if you look at the gold to silver ratio, it is so out of whack and so manipulated right now that there is probably zero or close to zero probability that we don't see that ratio start to flip at some point. And you're going to have a tremendous upside with silver. And so if you take all that into account, I think, I think you can build a sound strategy around that. And the next question really comes down to allocation and personal preferences and, you know, what can you afford to, to start to do? Well, we talked the gold to silver ratio. There's also a huge opportunity there. What is gold again? The only other tier one asset. What is the ratio price wise? Let's say it's 80 to one right now. It's coming out of the ground or it came out of the ground for 5,000 years in terms of a geologic ratio at 16 to one. Silver 16 times more abundant in the earth than is gold. It's now seven to one. My buddy Keith Newmeyer, the CEO of First Majestic, one of the biggest mining companies in the world, told me 10 times personally and tells the world all the time in his videos publicly, it's coming out of the ground at seven to one. It's found like your skin is epidermis. Silver is found in nature in a form called epithermal, very near the surface. Big deposits were found decades ago. So if you realize that for 5,000 years that the price and the geologic ratio was 16 to one, as we got near the industrial revolution, gold's role as money and silver's role as an industrial metal and because of logistics, while the mining ratio stayed the same, the price ratio has averaged over the last 150 years, roughly 40, 42 to one price wise. But here's the thing. It's now coming out of the ground at seven to one. So that geologic ratio has been cut in half, arguably then so should the price ratio should be like 20 to one. But here's the thing, all of the silver that's been accumulated over the last 75 years and used in industrial applications or military applications like 500 ounces in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile, and go back and look at the Manhattan Project and the amount of silver used in the centrifuges, I mean, millions and millions and millions and millions of ounces, all of the things that are used in military, in green, solar panels and whatnot, water purification, uh, electric batteries for electric vehicles, um, or or electronics or anything that conducts electricity, along with the, the renaissance it's experienced in monetary demand, including the fact that last year we had over a 200 million ounce shortfall in supply versus demand, including in the fact that of a billion ounces mined last year where 1.2 billion plus were demanded, 
only 350 million came from companies mining silver because it's harder and harder and harder and harder and harder to find. 65% of the silver that came to market was either through recycling or companies stumbling across it. Oh, look, we found some silver while we were digging for tin. And so it's a situation where it's depleting in nature. It's increasing in industrial and military uses. It's experienced a monetary renaissance, and yet it's priced at 80 to 1. Well, something ain't right here. You could argue that it's the best opportunity in the world, whereby if you want to ultimately end up in gold, the only tier one asset, you don't want to sell all your silver, but you buy silver at an 80 to 1 ratio. And if all it does is get to its 200 year average, of roughly 40 to one, you double when you switch back into gold. If you spent a million on silver today, it would be like buying 2 million in gold. Now this has happened once in my oh. career. So look, this has happened one other time in human, uh, in my career, human history. In 2010, I woke up to notice an 85 to one ratio and I called my friend Bix Weir. I said, Bix, this is, this is unbelievable. I said, the ratio is 85 to one. I said, um, this has only happened one other time in human history. We got to tell everyone to trade their gold right now into silver. And I did that with all my clients. I did a podcast with Bix. Seven months later, in mid-2011, we had $50 silver in 1915, 1915 gold. That's 37 to 1, just below its 150-year average. That was almost two and a quarter times what they started with without spending any money trading back into gold. If they traded, if they got 85 ounces for one ounce of gold, they got, they only needed 37 to go back. So when you talk about opportunity and potential, not only could we see silver really appreciate because it's been held down and it's below its half of its 1980 peak, but trading it back into gold, it doesn't even matter what the price is. It's what the ratio is. And yep. when it's coming out of the ground at seven to one and it's priced at 80 plus to one and the demand for it is increasing and the supply is decreasing, it's about as good of an opportunity as you will ever find ever in investing with virtually no downside risk. I, I think it's about as good of an investment opportunity as you will ever find. But you will find, I rarely say the word investment when we talk about gold and silver. It's wealth. Yep. Silver is too. But I would be lying if I said it doesn't offer, I think, a hell of an investment opportunity if you play it that way. I think that's awesome. So um, how, how do people watching this video today um, find out more about Miles Franklin and how do they get in touch with you guys? Well, so they could send us an email at info at Miles Franklin. We have a website, milesfranklin.com, where we allow up to 10 grand in purchasing. If you send us an email at info at Miles Franklin, we will send you a price list that is much more competitive than our website. Uh, we kind of keep that close to the vest. Um, it'll be as competitive as anyone in the, in the industry, virtually. Um, we can answer any questions that you have. Um, we are a hybrid model. All of the brokers in my company are friends I've had most of my life. Um, long before I was a businessman, in most cases, um, Little League, uh, elementary school. Uh, these are people that had very distinguished careers before they came to me, many of them on Wall Street, degrees from Wharton, master's degree in business administration from Temple. We're talking some of the best um, minds to talk about this stuff, I think, in the industry. We will answer questions on geopolitical events, on economic events, on world events. We will um, recommend bullion, not numismatics. Unless you're dying to buy them, we will make sure you know what you're doing before you do it. We want you to get the biggest bang for the buck, the greatest liquidity, the least amount of subjectivity, and we will help you with IRAs or just with understanding what's going on and how to buy metals. Or if you want to do it yourself online, go ahead and do that. But info at milesfranklin.com is something uh, that I would recommend. Say the Silver Surfer sent me. We'd love to know they come from you. We'll treat them the right way and uh, make sure they get the best price and the best information. And uh, I look very forward to coming back on with the live stream with you, picking up where we left off and hopefully talk to some of your listeners uh, who uh, who are watching this now? Yeah, we're gonna do that. So you guys can tell stacking surfer. If you say silver surfer, Andy will know who that is too. Um, I'm sorry, pardon me. I'm th I'm thinking I'm thinking the what uh, what's that the uh, Avengers that yeah my kids are yeah, watching. It's, it's all good, stacking surfer. Uh, so this is my fifth podcast I've done today, and I have one with <laughs> with uh, with um, uh, the Silver Slayer uh, in go. five minutes. So you there know. You it's just it's all mumbo jumbo but you know what i mean and and i i'm serious i appreciate it very much and we would like to know where they come from so 
please put that in the subject line and we'll take good care of your listeners. You have my word on that. That sounds awesome. Well, Andy, thank you for coming on. Um, we will have you on here soon. I just need to find the right date that works for both of us and yeah. we'll get it scheduled so everybody knows and uh, we'll get this video out there as fast as we can. And um, until next time, peace out, everybody. And Andy, thank you so much. You got it, brother. Thank you.